Good Friday afternoon, everybody. Rick Floor here, quality engineer, customer advocacy for the Adobe Photography products with a Twin Cities Lightroom Community live event. I got to looking back at the calendar and realized it had been over a year since we'd done a live event. And we not only are we primed for one, but we're probably hungry for one, you know, in light of the pandemic and how closed off we've been over the past two years. In fact, I looked back and the last time we met together in person was March of 2019. And two days later, uh, Adobe sent us a note and closed their office doors and suspended all in customer visits. And our personal visits with customers have been curtailed ever since. Now that's due to expire as company policy sometime this month. But my guess is with the current situation of the pandemic that we will probably be extending that. The Twin Cities Lightroom user community normally would meet in March on the second Wednesday. At this point, I do not know if that meeting will go forward. Right now, I am planning for that meeting to happen for us in person at Concordia, but that's going to depend on the state of COVID, uh, what Concordia's situation is, and what Adobe's current policy is. So stay tuned for that. I wanted to welcome you all here today. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon in Apple Valley, Minnesota, where I'm domiciled. And we have no snow on the ground yet, and I'm looking forward to that remaining the case at least for another week or two. So today, we're going to talk about masking tools that were released at Adobe Max in late October of this year. And I, I know the word game changer is tossed around a lot. The you know biggest feature in years, I've heard that quite a bit. Matt Kleskowski personally told me that it was the biggest thing he had seen since Lightroom 2. And since this is Lightroom 11, that's going back a ways. But it really is, I consider it to be the biggest um, leap forward in editing capabilities in the Lightroom editing suite. Since local adjustments came in with the brush and the radial and um, actually it was the brush and the graduated filter first and then the radial to a later way back in version two back in the 2008 2009 time frame so it's been long overdue and it's very welcome the reason we're talking about it today is because on uh, the 29th of november i posted the image that you see above me here onto the facebook group for the twin cities lightroom community and i got some questions first question came from shakun how Question from Kevin, are there any plans for impersonal meeting? Maybe in March, no sooner, fingers crossed. And I said, you know, I may do a Facebook live event in December. Maybe, maybe edit this rainbow pick. And I got a note back from Richard Berger saying that he would welcome that. So along with a couple of texts, along with a couple of phone calls, along with a couple of private messages sent to me, as well as the posts that were in Facebook, we decided that we would go after this today. So that's what we're here to do today. So a couple of things, a little, little bit of housekeeping here. The features you're going to see today are in Lightroom Classic. I'm going to be demoing them in Lightroom Classic 11. They are also available in Lightroom Desktop version 5, Camera Raw that was just released with Photoshop at Max in October, as well as Lightroom 7 on your iOS and your Android devices. So the tools you see today are going to be available on all platforms and these edits do sync back and forth between the platforms so you're made aware of it um, keep in mind though if you are using multiple versions of Lightroom let's say you've got version 10 on a laptop and you can't update it because of the OS is you know you're basically locked into an OS due to hardware you do not want to attempt to send the new masking edits back to old versions of Lightroom because old versions of Lightroom with the exception of 10.4, will not understand it. And if you edit those images in the older version, they will replace all the hard work you've done in the new version. If you've updated all your machines to version 11, you're OK. So don't worry about it then. So a little about this picture. This is a picture I put, took way back in 2006 with my first full frame digital SLR, a Canon 5D. No Mark II, no Mark III. It was just a plain 5D. And we were camping at the State Forest Campground near Finland, Minnesota, and my son was itching to go fishing, but it had been raining all day. And just as the storm broke at the campground, I said, well, why don't you grab your fishing pole? I'll grab my camera bag and we'll run down to Tetaguch State Park and we'll go out on the point and you can cast around, see if you can hook a trout. 
And as we came down the, the long flight of wooden stairs that lead to the, the bay here, we found this beautiful rainbow breaking over the point. So I hastily set up a tripod and snapped a picture of this beautiful rainbow. Back then I was really religious about exposing to the right. So you'll see that I've got my highlights all lumped together on the right hand side of my histogram here. And I just clipped a little bit of the shadows underneath the log and underneath the boulders in the foreground. So I got the entire range of the exposure within the range of my camera. And considering the 5D original back at the time didn't have the dynamic range of the modern cameras today, it was a pretty good capture for what we were doing. So we started out there. This was my capture. My son didn't catch any fish and we went home and I went to edit this picture. Now this picture does not look that exciting. And I remember looking at it on my memory card and thinking, well, it's okay. I was looking at the camera JPEG at the time. And then I got it into Lightroom and looked at the raw file and said, boy, that's dull and flat and not at all like I remember it. So I set about editing and I edited it for a very, very long time in Photoshop. And I recall that I spent a weekend on this image. I spent about five hours one day and a five hours the next day meticulously masking these areas inside the tree, trying to get every little bit of sky selected. And I was successful and produced an image that looked something like this. So this was the image as it came off of my Photoshop experience. And this is the image that I ultimately printed and then made available for sale. But how do we get there? Well, it was a lot of heartache and a lot of work in Photoshop to do that back in the day. And we're talking back in the Photoshop CS5 timeframe, I'm gonna say, CS4 perhaps when I was editing this image. So fast forward, I get the new tools and I said, I should try out one of my signature images on the new tool set and see how it works. And the result was the image that was posted on Facebook. And I quite literally did that image in just a little over 10 minutes. And when I looked back at the 10 hours I had spent producing the image in Photoshop with what were the best tools available at the time, I was kind of surprised at how far we'd come. So I thought I would walk you through a little bit of the new masking features and we would take you through the editing. Now, just because we've got new masking tools in Lightroom doesn't mean you can throw out old editing techniques and good techniques that you should be following. And I always say, if you're gonna do local adjustments to an image, which basically masking is all about local adjustments, you want to edit the entire image first. So that's what we're gonna do is we're gonna edit the entire image first. We want the image to look not like this, but more like this when we're there. And I wanna show you just a little bit about how we get there. So the first thing that's very important, we're going to be using a new mask called the Select Sky Mask. Any place I have an interface with the sky, we want to be very careful. And if you can look, I hope this is coming on the video, you can see that I have red fringing and cyan fringing here on the edges. This was shot with a 17 to 40 lens. It was an L-series lens at the time, but it had a little bit of chromatic aberration at the edges. So that's one of the things we want to do is we want to fix chromatic aberration. So I'll go down to my lens correction panel and I'll remove chromatic aberration and enable the profile correction. And we'll zoom in on that area now. If I toggle off chromatic aberration, you'll see that that fringing goes away. And that's going to make me have a better sky selection when we go forward. So that's a good first step. Another good first step is to straighten the horizon. Um, you know, I don't know if the software keys on that or not, but I sure do. So I'm going to grab the crop tool, make sure I've got the angle tool selected and I'm going to drag it across this nice straight line of Lake Superior and I'm going to let go and it's going to straighten my horizon. Now I'm going to turn on the info panel and you can see that I have 4229 pixels. If I undo you can see I had 4368. Anytime you straighten you're going to lose a little bit of your image off to the edges and expect that. It's not too severe here. It's always better if you can hold your camera straight in the field but I list a little to starboard some days, I list a little to port the others, so that's where we're at. So there we are, we're straightened now. Now the one thing I wanna do is I wanna edit this image as a whole. So I might do some basic brightness, contrast, sky kind of adjustments to begin with. First of all, it was shot outdoors and it was shot with the camera as shot white balance. I'll change that white balance to auto. I like Lightroom's white balance with that little bit of warmth in the center around where the rainbow meets the arch. I think that's a little bit better. And I'm gonna give Lightroom's auto a try. Back in the time when I shot this, auto did poorly. 
it was successful about one out of 10 images for me. Now it's successful about nine out of 10. So I'm gonna give it an auto again. You can see I brightened up my shadows quite a bit without losing too much of my sky. That to me feels a little bit bright. I might dial that back just a bit by taking the exposure back off and I feel a little bit better about that. One thing I want to talk about is spot removal. Spot removal is expensive computationally and it takes a lot of computer power to remove spots. But one thing that doesn't work is with the new masking, if you use an AI mask, particularly the sky select mask, you need to do your spot removal first. So I recommend everybody give their sky a check for spots. Do your sky removal or your spot removal, then do your select sky mask. If you do it in that order, you won't end up with weird artifacts. If you select sky, edit the image first, and then do your spot removals on your dust spots and your little droplets of water and things like that, you will not get a good result. So I recommend everybody give it a pass through the spot removal. And I'll put it in this mode right here. I'm gonna turn on the toolbar with the letter T and make sure that you've got visualized spots turned on and you can kind of just zoom in and see, do I have any spots anywhere? And if I did, they would show up as a bright white circle. I don't seem to have any. I'm gonna zoom back out and we're going to turn off the spot tool and we're gonna go back into our image here. So essentially what we've got is we've got a new masking regime. A new masking regime lives underneath this icon, underneath your histogram. If you'll remember, formerly we had a radial tool a graduated tool that was a linear gradient, and we had an adjustment brush. Those now all live inside this masking tool. And if I click the masking tool, you'll see it expands into a panel. And that panel includes AI, select subject, and select sky. And I will probably hit one of them wrong today. I'm a very alphabetical person, and select sky should be on top in my mind, so I always go to the top, but that's just me. Your traditional brush, linear gradient, radial gradient are here. And then there's three tools that were formerly buried inside the brush linear and radial called color range, luminance range, and depth range. This image doesn't have any depth information in it. So there won't be a depth range a portion for this particular um, image to adjust. But if you had shot with a Lightroom camera on an iPhone, it would capture depth information. You'd be able to use that to control your masks. So the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to select sky. Select sky is an AI mask. A bezel appears in the bottom center of your image saying it's detecting the sky. It's going to take about five seconds on my system and then it's going to bring you in and it's going to show you the mask. The mask is in bright green. I tend to run with a bright green mask. By default, orange or ruby lith will be the color. And because I shoot so many sunrises and sunsets, that mask is not good at showing me what it's selected out of a red area. So I go with the green mask wherever possible. You can choose any color you like. Now what's happened is, as I've clicked the mask, the choices for the mask have disappeared and been replaced by the local adjustment panel that allows you to choose what you're going to do to your image. And it's gonna keep the mask here until I move a slider. Now up here, a, a little panel has appeared. I will expand it so you can see it better. That's called the masks panel. The masks panel is unlike any other panel in Lightroom in that I can undock it and move it wherever I'd like. I can also put it inside the edit stack if I'd like. I can pull it out and I can shrink it down if it's in the way. So I'm gonna use it expanded and I'll probably set it in the middle of the image because it stands off here. It's gonna show me a thumbnail of the mask. And in this mask, I think it's very important to name the masks. So I double click it and I say sky just so that I know that that's my sky mask because if I get 15 or 20 masks going on an image, I wanna be able to tell them apart easily. And by selecting the mask, it will tell me what's inside of it. It's got a sky selection mask inside of it. And what I would like to do is I would like to edit this mask. But before I do that, I'm gonna make another copy of sky. And I'm gonna say duplicate sky. And up here, I'm gonna change the name and I'm gonna call it ground. Then what I'd like to do is I'd like to change it to select everything but the ground. So using the ground mask group, I'll select sky, right click, and I will say invert. And now I have a mask that is just the ground. And I might even rename that just the ground. And both of those were selected by AI and they work quite well. So if I select sky and we zoom in again, you can see that all those little bits inside of the tree are now selected. And those little bits are going to be adjusted when I select the sky. If I select ground, you'll see that all those little branches and twigs and things like that 
are now selected. And that's a really nice thing to have. That's what took me all those hours in Photoshop when I adjusted this image a decade and a half ago was to get all of those particular things chosen separately. So now that we've got the mask, I'll zoom back out and I'll adjust the sky. I want drama and drama is the black slider. So if I grab the black slider and I start to slide it, you can see what happens to my sky. I crank it all the way down and I've got a lovely amount of drama that's appeared here in the sky. And I really, I'm looking at this image at 200% and I've got virtually no halos here. If I do end up with some halos, I may want to dial it back just a little bit. Now I could take you through the process of all the things I selected, but it was easier for me to create a preset of what that slider adjustment was. And this was the sky preset that I actually used. And it uses a negative exposure, a positive contrast, a negative blacks, a negative texture, because I don't want to show all of that graininess in the sky. I want it to be smooth. A little bit of positive clarity to give it some punch a little bit of dehaze to kind of brighten the colors and give them some more definition and an increase in saturation. So if I go over here to the masking panel, I've got a little eyeball icon. I can actually turn that adjustment on and off and you can see very quickly what was done. And that's what I, the way I go about it is I, I create the mask, I do my adjustments and when I get to a point where I'm liking it and I'm happy, I'll lock in and I'll move to the next step. Now, moving to the next step may mean that I have to come back and adjust this later, but because I've labeled everything, I'm in a good position to do that. So we're gonna select ground now. Ground is just an inverse of the sky, and I want to give it some more color. And you know, it's dark, so I might want to give it exposure. If I go too far, I get halos. If I go just a little bit, it does wonders. But I created a preset for this as well to show you the adjustments I used on my original image. And that's the land preset and it goes up exposure two-thirds of a stop takes the blacks down 50 that improves the contrast if I take the blacks back you can see that it makes it a lot flatter looking so undo that and then it comes down here and that's really just a little pump to the shadows and that's about it that's all the exposure adjustments that we did to the ground so very very quickly I've selected two masks and I've applied a half a dozen sliders and by the way, if I ever want to dial this back, I've got the ability to do that. You'll notice over here in the sliders, I've got positive values and I've got negative values. If I wanted to adjust to those and say, back this off 10%, all you have to do is collapse this little disclosure triangle here and you'll be presented with an amount slider that will let you dial up or dial down the entire effect of that mask and it will remember to move the sliders in the correct direction, either positively or negatively, to give you that dial up or that dial down. So that's where we're at there. The next thing I want to do is I want to create a mask to select the water. So I'll go up here and I'll hit Create Mask, and I think I'll use a brush stroke to select water. And when I use a brush stroke, I get this brush icon. I'm trying to find a dark place to show you the, eye, the brush stroke. Eye. There it is right there. And what I want to do is I want to create something that's very sharp. I want to create an edge that will capture this horizon line. So I'm going to put it down on the horizon line. I'm going to click. There's my green. I'm going to hold the shift and click and I'm going to come across and it's going to draw me a straight line around my horizon. Now I'll make the mask a little smaller and give it a little bit more filter. I'm holding down the shift key to change the feather and I'm holding, not holding the shift key and I'm just moving my mouse wheel to move the particular brush size up and down. You can do that with the bracket keys or a number of other ways if you use a tablet. And I'm just gonna paint in the rest of the water. And I'm not trying to be too careful or too cautious here. Maybe I wanna cut that feathering down just a little bit. But I've got the ability to paint. I've got the ability to erase. I've got the ability to do other things. And you know, my goal is just to quickly show you how I masked. Now, one thing I might come in and do is I might come in and say, Okay, now I would like to subtract anything that's red from that mask. And it will come in and it will subtract all of that red there. So what I did, just to repeat, is I said, I've got a mask, it's got a brush. I would like to add to or subtract from it. I chose subtract. And I said, subtract anything that's in this color range. And then I clicked on a red spot on the beach and it pulled it back. I've got a refine tool that allows me to refine that edge just a little bit. And I'm not being very careful here. This is a three minute edit for a 10 minute job, so it's gonna go pretty fast. And then I'm going to adjust that water down. 
There again, I may want some drama, so I might come into this black slider and pull it down. I may kick the saturation up, and I may want to accentuate these oranges that are coming off of this, this nice creamy orange color I have in the sky. So I might just, you know, just, just warm it up just ever so slightly. And we're doing it fast. We're doing it down and dirty here. It's, it's not going to be the greatest, but you know, that's kind of our goal. And if I wanted to, I could apply the preset I used on the image before and say this was my water preset I used before. You can see that I went a little less overboard than I had here. Next, I might go in and say, you know, I'm going to pull this over here. These clouds in this area feel a little bit muddy to me and they feel a little bit muddy here. I'd like to see more definition. So I'll create a new mask. And this new mask will also be a brush stroke. It'll have a decent amount of feather to it. And I'll just paint in some area here. And I went too far. I can hold down the Option or the Alt key. And I can paint out. I'm just after these muddy blue clouds in the top of the sky. Right there. That looks pretty good. And what I want to do is I want to adjust them so they have more definition. I'll come down here and I'll choose my cloud preset from the image before, the right hand sky preset. And what it does is it puts a little bit of boost into the shadows, kicks up the whites a little, brings down the darks. And if you want to see that effect, what it does to those clouds, it just makes them pop just ever so slightly. And that's what my goal is, to make the clouds pop ever so slightly. If I see a spot I missed, I can come back with a brush. Or if I see a spot I want to get rid of, I can come in with the Alt key and make it erase, and it works out pretty good. Maybe make it just a little bit darker around the top of the rainbow so that the rainbow stands out. And that's kind of my goal with it. Lastly, I wanted to adjust the color and, and brightness of the foliage over here on the shoreline. And to do that, I used a color selection. So I'll hit my plus on my mask key again. And I'll grab the brush stroke. No, I didn't say brush stroke. I wanted to grab color selection. So I'll say color range. And I'll grab some little bits of green here, just a little bit of green right there. And you can see it selects a lot more of the image than what I wanted. So I'll dial out back that refine tool and I get it back here. And now I've pretty much got the foliage that I want and I've got a little bit to clean up. There's a little bit on this rock, a little bit on this rock. So I'll say subtract and use the brush and I'll just come in here and I'll brush out wherever I don't want to adjust those green tones. And now if I look at my mask, I'm looking pretty good. And for here, I might kick up a little bit of exposure just so you can see what's happening. That's the area that I've selected. And I'll apply my preset for that, which was foliage. And what foliage does is it gives me a little bit of increase in exposure, only a fifth of a stop. It gives me a little bit of green tint. It gives me a little boost in saturation, a little boost in sharpness, a little boost in noise reduction. Anytime I'm increasing the exposure value, I always like to give it also an increase in noise reduction because anytime I'm boosting shadows, I'm boosting the area of the photo that's noisiest. So I want to take care of that. And I'll come back in and toggle that eyeball on and off. And you can kind of see what happens. It's just a little bit of nice light green that appears on top of the picture right there. And that's in a nutshell, the entire series of edits. Now, if I bring you up the actual image, that I finished, the finished edit, you'll see it looks a little bit differently and it's primarily masking selection and some changes in settings that I've done globally. So I'm going to pull this masking panel closed by clicking the mask icon and you can kind of see that I've, I've tweaked some of the adjustments here just a little bit harder. And one of the other things that I've done is I've come back in and I've saying for the, for those who are saturation sensitive, I might dial that saturation back 30% to give myself a less electric blue sky and a little bit more natural of an image. This is the kind of image that you could have entered in a club competition and no one would bat an eye. Whereas if you had that saturation cranked all the way up like I had it before, there might be a judge in the audience who's, who's you know, sensitive to that. So you want to be careful. If I'm going to print it, I'm going to print this image. If I'm going to enter it in a contest, I'm probably going to enter it this image, but in any case, all of the masking still applies. If you look at the masking of my finished edit, it's the same five masks, the sky, the land, the water, the right hand portion of the sky and the foliage. And in each case, it's one of those particular tools. It's a color range combined with a brush. Color range to apply the effect, the brush to erase it where it doesn't belong. Here we had just a simple brush, the right hand sky brushed in the areas I wanted it. 
the water was selected with a brush and I actually used the um, the sky mask and the brush mask both to create the water and then the land is just an inverse of the sky below it and that's pretty much how the image goes together it's a very very quick edit it's um, a simple set of edits that will apply to a lot of the work that you do but I'm hoping that it'll be something that you can use in your area as well I wanted to talk about one additional type of masking that we didn't really cover um, you know we, we covered color range I'm gonna go back to the to the imported state so we can look at this we didn't talk about luminance range luminance range allows me to set select a value of tones bright tones or dark tones so if I select luminance and I drag a little square around here it will select different areas of my photo where the luminance matches and then I've got this really nifty luminance tool over here which allows me to dial back feather move change and I can control areas based upon their brightness or darkness but it's easiest just to drag a little square over the area you want to be so if I just wanted to select the brightest area of this image and then drop its exposure, I've got the ability to do that. I'm showing you this as a demonstration, not as an actual editing technique here, but perhaps I might want to combine that with something else. Like I may want to say something like, you know, I'm gonna delete this mask by hitting the three dot menu and delete the mask and I'm gonna say select the sky that I did not correct the horizon but it will still probably get it okay because it understands that photographers do some things I've got some sky selection that's spilled over here maybe what I want to do is I want to say subtract from my sky a brush stroke get that big hard-edged brush here click it right there hold down the shift key click it right here and it will take out all of that land or all of that water that was basically covered by the land and anything behind it got it okay it got my nice horizon edge okay and I have no spillover of my sky mask into my water and then I could also say subtract luminance range and say subtract the area of this little point here and it did that quite nicely so I'm gonna do that with a close-up I'm gonna undo that and I'm gonna say subtract and I'm just gonna say luminance range so I'm going after this dark area right here and it will pull that right out of my mask so that when I come back and make my adjustment on my sky I am not getting any of that area that was reflected in the water I'm not getting any of that area that was part of the hole in the arch and I'm also not getting any of these highlight areas they were actually specular highlights of the sky on the rock that might be causing me to, to pick up some extra things there so I can do some really really nice edits like kick up the contrast a lot and boost the saturation and maybe maybe boost those oranges get myself a completely different feel from what I had before highlights down would probably help a lot here oh yeah I can get a real nice stormy feel if I do that so I've got the ability to control everything because every one of these tools has the ability to add subtract and intersect and we didn't talk about intersect so I'm going to go ahead and delete all masks here and let's see here we'll just delete this mask right here and we're down to no masks again so I'm going to draw a radial mask we haven't really done any radials today and I'm going to make a radial mask and I'm going to set the feathering on that mask to be zero so it's got a very sharp edge we're going to set the exposure to be plus five so it's a circle now if I want to add to that mask a radial gradient and I add you'll see I get overlapping circles and wherever I you know drop that second radial it connects to and overlaps with this existing radial. I've also got the ability to subtract a radial or any other mask and where I subtract it it takes a bite out of it. You can see how you can do that quite easily here with a third circle. So you got the ability to add to a mask, you got the ability to subtract from a mask, but you also have the ability to intersect with a mask. I'm going to delete that mask and I'm going to delete mask number two. if I can find delete there I am and I'm going to draw yet another radial mask this time I'm not going to draw the mask I'm going to select the mask that currently exists I need to undo that radial gradient come on the, the joy of live TV there we go so I've got all three of my gradients back I want to delete them all off cleanly now what I'd like to do is I'd like to select this radial, but instead of adding to or subtracting it, I want it to intersect an existing mask. 
So I'll click over here and I'll say intersect mask with and it will let me intersect with another mask. I'll choose a radial. Now what it's doing is it's only giving me the overlap of the masks. So if I want to do the intersection, I could say, you know, just give me the overlap of these two masks. And those masks don't have to be the same. They could be something completely different. Like I could say, show me a sky mask. Let's do that. I'll go ahead and delete this mask so that we're completely clean. I'll say, show me select sky. It'll calculate the sky new. It calculates it every time you draw a sky mask, which is why if you don't want to calculate it, you don't want to duplicate it. And I'd like to intersect it with a brush. And I'm going to grab that brush, make it really sharp again, click here, drag across to here. Now I've selected only the highlights in the water by saying, show me the sky, which picked up the highlights in the water and now intersect it with this brush and the brush stroke only covers this area so I can control those highlights essentially independently of the rest of the image and it's very hard to see unless I zoom in because those highlights are quite small but you can see that I'm controlling just the highlights so that's the portion of the sky that intersected with the brush mask so there's all kinds of things you could do with that you could say well, I'd like to select the sky I'd like to duplicate the sky and I like to invert the sky. Now that I've got that sky inverted, that's what it looks like. And I'd like to intersect that with only the place where it's dark. So I'll say luminance range and I'll grab a dark area. And now I've got just an area that's dark. So basically I've been able to pick up the dark areas of the water over here on this side and say, add blues to it if I wanted to. I could add a black component if I wanted it to and I can make it very, very, very mysterious. I could add dehaze to it and really crank it or crank it the other way and brush it out. But the, all of these tools have the ability to select an area. They have the ability to add to an existing selection. They have the ability to subtract from an existing selection and they have the ability to intersect with a different selection. And using those, you can get a lot of editing power. And I think, you know, looking at this image as finished edit, it, it shows quite well what you can do. I mean, sky select, that was an automated process. The AI did that for you. You might have spent a minute cleaning it up, but, you know, it's a minute. Invert it and you've got the land. Now you've got two complete masks that you can do completely different things with. And if I turn off all of the other masks in the image, you can see that that's just what we did with the automatic mask. The automatic mask was picked out by AI, selected the sky, we inverted it to select the ground, and then we did some slider adjustments. And that's one mask essentially that was created. Then we added water with a brush and we were able to get that brush to look like it belonged in the scene with the rest of these things. We were able to pop up that right hand portion of the sky to give it a little bit less muddy look. And then we were able to tune the foliage with a little bit of brightness. Well, that's the end of the demo today. And I, I, I see finally I've had a chance to look at the comments section and Aaron says it's been too long. Glad you're doing a little show on telling us about this great update. So I discovered a feature in um, Facebook recently where there's a Facebook meeting room that they have. And it's similar to the Zoom and the Microsoft Teams and the Google and the various other meeting rooms that we've all been using. But I'm going to be experimenting with that. I'm thinking about maybe making a lunchtime Friday one hour long drop in where we just drop in and we talk about Lightroom, we talk about photography, we talk about the world, whatever we'd like to do. But it's, it's something I'm considering anyway. So look, look for that. I may, I may launch that over the Christmas break when everybody's got some time off and I've got some spare time during the middle of the days too. But other than that, that's what I wanted to show you for today. I wanted to remind you all of these tools that I showed you today are available for your phones, for your tablets, uh, they're available if you're a Bridge Camera Raw user. They're available if you use the new Lightroom desktop software. Um, you won't find them on Lightroom Web yet, but they're working on that. And I would expect them to, to be coming right along. Um, I'm hoping to be able to give you some news about the user group meeting in January. Um, if, if it does happen, it will be the second Wednesday of March. If it does not happen on the second Wednesday of March, the next time when it would come up in our calendar would be the second Wednesday of June. 
And like I say, that'll depend upon the conditions of COVID, the conditions at Concordia College, and what, what Adobe's policy is towards customer get-togethers. But it's been great having you today. This was designed to be a relatively short meeting. Uh, it will be available on video on Facebook Live. And if you've got some Twin Cities Lightroom community users who do not live on Facebook, I will be posting this video as well to our YouTube channel. So I'm sorry I, I don't have time for questions today. You can feel free to put them in the chat pod for the live event and I will try to answer them over the next day or two. But I want to thank you all for coming and I want to thank you for continuing to be Adobe customers.